All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman, coming at you from uh, Boca Raton, Florida, where we are about to get slammed by this uh, this big Hurricane Dorian. So just getting in a quick episode before we get crushed. But uh, so tonight, uh, we're going to start off uh, just with the, uh, the real quote of the day is the segment that I've been calling it. This comes from uh, one of my favorite artists, uh, Kid Cudi, um, off of his song, Man on the Moon. So this is just the intro. He says, I never gave a fuck. I never gave a fuck about what people thought about me. I mean, I did, but like, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? You gonna love me, man. You gonna love me. So I think kind of what he's saying about, you know, he in some ways is saying, you know, that he doesn't care about what people, uh, you know, think about him, but then at the same time acknowledges that, you know, he's human just like the rest of us. And there is some inherent degree, no matter how far we kind of try to branch off and do our own thing um, and be unique, you know, there is always sort of that, uh, that judgment coming in from other people. But that's an interesting lyric that, that I yeah, like. That whole, that whole album is pretty good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the classic. First, oh yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And uh, what you guys hear, who you guys hear right there, is my friend Michael Tobin. He is uh, the uh, currently or just finished up, right? Uh, yeah. Internship. Sweet. Uh, just finished up an internship on the Spot News Desk with the Wall Street Journal, which is super awesome. He's also currently the editor in chief of the Emerald which is the University of Oregon student newspaper, which is actually the way that me and Michael first met when I was uh, still in college writing for the paper a couple years ago. And I, you know, I always thought you, you know, produce dope content. So I'd kind of just been, you know, following you on Instagram and like saw the stuff about the wall street journal and, you know, saw you're doing your thing. So, you know, that's why I wanted to, to, you know, bring you on the show and, and have a conversation. So cool. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, man. I'm sorry I cut you off back there. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me on. And it's cool to talk with you in the midst of the hurricane. So yes, absolutely. Sweet. Well, I wanted to find out just to start off, you know, kind of what what kind of got you into journalism? What was this something that, you know, you knew sort of like before you started the U of O that you wanted to get into it? Or did you find it a different path? Um, I don't know if I've told you this story, but essentially, um, I came to UO like wanting to do chemistry and science and I did it for a few terms and it was just like not that enjoyable. And I wasn't really ready to spend four years of my life kind of doing chemistry that I didn't really enjoy and kind of doing all these tedious lab assignments. And I'd always kind of had an interest in, um, public radio and the stories that people tell. And I would always listen to, like NPR with my mom as a kid. So that was kind of like my first like introduction to journalism. And she listened to like the news a lot. And I just kind of got started thinking about, um, you know, what would my life be like if I pursued this different path? And I'd always been kind of interested in writing and I was just ready to do it. So nice. So was it kind of like, I'm thinking like when you kind of got into college and were kind of going along the sciencey route, was it kind of, it was kind of always like a hobby, like sort of journalism but you weren't fully sure whether you could whether you wanted to like turn it into a career uh yeah that was kind of an interesting and a good way to put it um i had kind of always had just kind of an interest in writing and telling stories and you know going to uo it's a school that kind of has a lot of different programs like they have a science program that's like pretty good and they also have really good journalism programs so it's just a good kind of like fallback option and it ultimately proved to be the right option so yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely um yeah i guess you got on the the second try right i guess so yeah and i i just wasn't ready to do four years of just like chemistry and not really enjoying it at all so that's exactly how i felt i started off as a business major and I was just, you know, starting the intro courses and it was like, all right, I know this is going to be useful and and good for me to know. But I was like thinking, you know, looking at the course catalog and like, man, I cannot do this yeah. for, for four more years. So yeah. I'd already gotten kind of halfway to the minor. So it's just like, you know what? All right, let me do this. And then 
switch up and actually pursue something I'm I'm passionate about which yeah and it's not to say that like those skills aren't useful and like that knowledge isn't useful because I think that knowledge like from what other discipline it comes from is useful in journalism so I definitely got something out of like doing all this chemistry but I just wasn't ready to do it for four years so right do you feel like any like pressure like either I mean from any angle like as far as like oh like I should do this as far as school but then like you really wanted to do journalism or was it more just you kind of figuring out what you really wanted to do? Um, Not really. I mean, so I'm doing a double major in journalism and political science, and I'm doing a minor in legal studies, and there's a lot of overlap in the political science and legal studies course load. Um, So I think like really just having like a, a knowledge of another subject and then using your journalism skills to apply that knowledge is really valuable. But I never felt really pressured to kind of like go into business or learn how to code or something like that. Um, But I just figured it was good to have knowledge of another discipline. So absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's something I think a lot of people kind of, you know, I guess realize going through college. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people from the U of O who've had that, that kind of similar experience where, you know, sometimes it is pressure, but, but, or other times, you know, it's just, they, they think it'll be like really useful to have, you know, a certain major, a certain, Mm -hmm tool set per se under their belt you know to get you know whatever they want kind of in the future but at the same time their real interest like lies somewhere else and they're kind of i think a lot of college is sort of figuring out how you can like uh you know sort of mix or or kind of tie both your your passion and your career or your future career together in a way and i think it's it's awesome it sounds like you know you, you found a really cool way to do that Yeah, I think, um, I don't want to say I got lucky. I worked really, really, really hard to be able to do what I'm doing right now. And I'm just like thankful I've gotten the opportunity to do it. So Awesome. Sweet. Well, I'm curious, what what were some of, you know, and this could be either from the Emerald or, you know, what you were writing for the Wall Street Journal. I'm curious, you know, what were some of your personal favorite, you know, articles to write? You know, maybe articles you had the most interest in, you know, either Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, learning something you didn't know before or just something that you, uh, that, you know, came out really well? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, I feel like I kind of have like a greatest hits catalog of like all the things that I, like I love to like talk about, like when people ask me questions like this. Um, there was this one story about how um, I found out that the UO had like several professors had gotten their login credentials like stolen in like a campaign from Iranian hackers, which was kind of interesting. Ah. And like that, <laughs> it's it's a wild story. It all came out of like a public records request um, where um, a grand jury out of the Southern District of New York had basically sent a subpoena to the UO asking them for like information about how much their access to um, like specific online journals had cost. And then they found out from the Department of Justice that like, essentially these Iranian hackers had coordinated a uh, campaign across universities across the world and like Duo was involved in like this hacking campaign. So it was pretty interesting. Um, And that took a few months of reporting to figure out and it was a great story. Um, How was it, how was it originally found out that these hacks were going on? uh, It came out of like, like I said, like this public records request, um, like the oh. Department of Justice, like on the national level had known about it and they had contacted UO for information to essentially bring an indictment against these Iranian hackers. So they could say like damage had been done, essentially. Um, wow. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. So, so and what can you just tell me, like what what kind of material were I mean, what were they kind of procuring from the U of O that was? What what was getting hacked? Uh, they wanted like access to information in like online journals. So like information. So like a lot of universities like pay f- like subscription fees so students can have access to, um, say like LexisNexis or something like that. Okay. Um, so like the Iranian hackers were like going after like professors' login credentials so they could get information to log into those subscription services. Huh. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. And this it was yeah, a this wild was- story. I bet. Yeah. So is it you and kind of a team of people, I'm guessing, working on that? Or were you sort Um, of attacking it hands on? I was attacking it hands on. Like, it came out of a public records request that I had filed back in like, 
I wrote the story in August 2018, and I filed a request in February 2018 for um, subpoenas that the UO had received from the Department of Justice. And they told me that there was one that was related to an ongoing investigation, and they couldn't give it to me. Um, and then I refiled my request a few months later, and I was able to get it and put together all the pieces. So Wow. So that was, I mean, you you were persistent through that. It sounds like that was a long time coming, like, what, half a year? Yeah, like pretty close to it. From, I, I yeah. just, like, waited for a while, and I was like, all right, I'll try again now to see if I can get it. So, right. And then I, um, I put the rest of it together through, like, court records and stuff, and I was able to kind of piece together a narrative, and then I asked the UO to confirm it, and they did, so... Hmm. Were you surprised that that they did confirm it? Did they have anything to lose in doing that, or was it? They gave me more information than I thought they would. Um, I wasn't expecting to get a list of like sixty-two redacted names of University of Oregon professors who had gotten their accounts compromised. Like I was really yeah. surprised at that, but I was surprised by how much they disclosed. Yeah. So. Wow, man, and that. I'm guessing that story must have kind of drawn a lot of attention. Did that draw a lot of attention kind of nationally? Did other, no, not, there, not, there were another, no, I guess, so, I guess there were so many schools that were affected, huh? That, right. So it was like Rod Rosenstein at the DOJ, he was the deputy attorney general. He had like announced like these indictments against these Iranian hackers, like back in March. So everybody like kind of knew about it already. Um, and I, I filed my story like super late on like a Friday night, like seven o'clock on a Friday. So like it kind of got slept on a little bit. Ah, uh, okay. It happens. Oh, on Friday. When, when's like the best time to, to publish that kind of stories or? Oh God. I would say that's a good like Monday or Tuesday morning scoop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that was, that was never like when I was writing, I, yeah, I, for whatever reason, I never even like paid attention to like what day the, the stories would come out, but that, I mean, it makes sense. It's like, you know, with, with Instagram posts or, or something like, you know, it's directly tied, you know, to like time of day and yeah, it is. we know tons about like, so I kind of wish analytics. I kind of wish I would have waited to publish it, but it is what it is. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it, the thing is like, I feel like back before, you know, we had the internet or something, you know, you would, you know, you kind of almost had one shot to get it right. Like with, yeah. public, if you were to publish it in print, and say there were certain people that didn't have a chance to see it, like they may not ever get a chance. But now, you know, for instance, like all of our viewers, you know, who are curious about, you know, that story can go, you know, find it on the, the Emeralds website right now, which yep. is obviously super awesome. <laughs> yeah, they can find it all online, which is kind of cool. But yeah, you're definitely right. I mean, like if I would have published that story at the wrong time or on the wrong day, if it was only in print, could have gotten missed completely. So. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, since we're on the topic of, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, I guess just your writing career, you know, I'm curious as far as, you know, I asked you a little about this before we got uh, started recording, but mm -hmm. I'm curious as far as when when you are reporting on a story and, and maybe maybe this was the case in this one, maybe it wasn't. But, you know, if you can think on like a story that, say, you had a very strong personal opinion on, you know, you were kind of doing the background research on on the story you wanted to put together and you, you know, really wanted to put it a certain way. Because, you know, from my perspective, you know, with writing for the Emerald, I was on the opinion desk. So it was, it was yeah. It, if I had an opinion about something, it was like, all right, like, you know, I'll just figure out how to, you know, word it somewhat professionally. But I was pretty free, you know, I thought to kind of take it where I wanted, but I'm curious, someone who, whose job it is to kind of report, uh, you know, accurately, you know, non-biased information. Is that, is that a challenge? Um, so I think like, this is like a lesson that like a lot of reporters have to learn like at one time or another in their career. And like, I learned it pretty early on, like I learned it, um, in like October, 2018 or so. And I started at the Emerald in like May, 2017. And I guess, like, the thing that's really hard for me um, is kind of, like, need to figure out a good way to phrase this. But essentially, it's, like, when people kind of reach conclusions that are based off incomplete information, and when they hold opinions that are based off incomplete information, it can be really difficult to report on those subjects. Like, 
essentially, if you take a really reductionist view of the world and a really reductionist viewpoint of how things work um, and just oversimplifying things, that can make stories really difficult. Um, and that generally happens, I would say, kind of in the world of activism and covering protests is a lot of people will kind of boil down very, very complex topics into um, essentially saying that there's one sole cause of them, which isn't necessarily the case. And I, I learned this lesson when I was covering um, a student protest about tuition where they were blaming um, exclusively the president of the university when it's very kind of difficult to understand how public education in Oregon is actually funded. And it's like a much larger statewide problem. So, I mean, I think the answer to overcoming um, a bias or, you know, being perceived as biased or something along those lines is to just report the hell out of the story and just kind of include as much detail as possible. So, you know, kind of understanding that, like, yes, the president of the University of Oregon has a role in this, but it's also a very large, like, state problem as well. So I think for me, it's it's just kind of a question of giving people all of the information, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. And I mean, I think that's something we often lack before we kind of like jump into, you know, forming an opinion about something. We often do it, I think, just naturally as humans, you know, we kind of see something and, you know, see something that catches our eye. I mean, I think oftentimes, you know, like think of something like the news, you know, just, just kind of the nightly news. It's like all of the stuff that they're reporting is like the the worst most like horrific stories like like i mean and not the point is not because they're horrific but it's because it's something that is easy for people to pay attention to i feel like you know they do a good job of of drawing people in um maybe not necessarily you know kind of going through the full journalistic process but kind of yeah i think that tv news has in some regards kind of like led to our lack of like public discourse or lack of like high public discourse. Um, and I think like the world now just generally kind of lacks nuance, which is a problem. So, right. And how about, well, I mean, what's your take on like, you know, a lot of news sites that use kind of the, the clickbait headlines, it's kind of becoming more and more of a problem. It seems like is like, how do you mean? Well, I mean, because it seems to make sense, you know, if, from a financial perspective, it seems like for a lot of uh, writers, you know, to, to, to write these kind of clickbait sensationalist headlines that are going to help draw, you know, tons of people to read their story, yeah. but at the same time may not at all capture, you know, the essence of the story. And then say someone just comes across that, you know, scrolling through their Twitter feed a lot of those people may not actually read the story. They're just going to see the headline and then come to a potentially incorrect opinion about it. Well, I think like a lot of the liability like lies on the reader, to be honest. Um, and I generally think that like the majority of like the population kind of like, I think takes a more like reductionist view to the news and kind of will only read the headline, which is a massive problem. Like I think that media literacy is probably one of the biggest problems. And I think that news organizations can do better, but I think we've generally, I think that cable news has kind of like failed the American public because it's essentially a shouting match on TV. So. Yeah, no debate on you. Uh, no debate with you on that one, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I agree with you. It, it does seem to be kind of a multifaceted problem as far as, yeah, you know, there's definitely the responsibility of, of people, you know, to actually go and inform themselves of the situation. But then also, you know, uh, you know, you bring up that, that journalists could do better. And I think, um, you know, it's probably, uh, you know, tough for some people to walk kind of the line between, uh, you know, wanting to report accurately versus, you know, also if they're, you know, if they're not a freelance writer, if they're writing kind of, uh, you know, if they work for, for a company and they feel some kind of, uh, you know, there's some kind of incentive to get a certain amount of views on their story, it could seem like that throws another variable that could, that could really kind yeah. of halt the process. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that all of the journalists that I've worked with are, honorable and ethical people who wouldn't try to essentially write clickbait headlines. So 
you know, I think the work speaks for itself. So, right. Like, I don't think we're in a position where people are going to be writing, you know, uh, supermarket tabloid headlines or anything like that. So, um, Mm -hmm. I generally think that people are trying to really engage in like a good faith public discourse and provide all the accurate information. So nice. And as far as, you know, the accurate information, uh, it's kind of a nice segue. I wanted to kind of ask you about just how, you know, how you feel kind of like mainstream media outlets nowadays, you know, um, constantly getting criticized, you know, for sort of reporting, uh, you know, a certain way on a story, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, you're right that the journalists, I mean, just as with most, you know, kind of professions that people are honorable and, and for the most part, and they're doing the best they can. Um, do, you, do you think, you know, with the state of kind of mainstream media and with all the criticism that it's been getting lately, do you, do you think that we are still getting, you know, fairly accurate, um, you know, stories and, and analysis of what's going on in the world? I do, but I think that a large segment of the population, or at least a, a small segment of the population who are very loud, kind of just want the news to conform to their own opinions, which is problematic. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think that people are looking for confirmation more than information that actually conflicts with their viewpoints that they actually have, which right. is really problematic. Yeah, confirmation bias. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's again, something I think you, you can't necessarily blame on the media. I mean, it's like, there's people they're they're going to be searching, you know, for, for stuff they're, they're already going to have an opinion. And I think it's, you know, certain, oftentimes certain types of people who, who are kind of more rigid, kind of stuck in their ways. Whereas I feel like, um, you know, the way we often make progress and, and not only kind of with, with journalism, but you know, just in the world at large, I feel like is is by having, you know, a discourse on things and, and arguing respectively, you know, uh, uh, respectfully, you know, not, you know, understanding other people's viewpoints besides our own and sort of helping, you know, trying to integrate their views and sort of get where they're coming from. Because, mm-hmm. you know, someone someone else could be coming from a completely different background and situation than you're coming from. And have totally different, you know, a totally different opinion, but just as valid of a uh, of an opinion, right? Sure. I mean, like, there's there's definitely a, a value in kind of understanding people's life experiences, but also at the same time, we're in a really scary place if you know two people can't agree on the same set of facts, which is really difficult. So, I mean, like, I think what I'm the most concerned about is kind of somebody who's in the communication in- industry is. Um, the ability for people to discern information that's true and false. Like, for example, um, there's a hashtag on Twitter last week that was boycott Olive Garden. And one person tweeted that um, Olive Garden was giving to the Trump re-election campaign, despite the fact that there were no Federal Election Commission donation records to support that claim at all. Like, nobody is verifying this information at all. And a lot of people are just really, really willing to believe these kind of things without checking up on them which is just kind of troubling so is it also i mean i i am not too familiar with that story was it also something that the media reported heavily on like without actually having any of the facts or was this no so it blew up on social media uh, in like one hashtag on twitter and then i saw like an article from the huffington post the next day saying like it wasn't true so okay so that's actually you know uh the media kind of playing like that sort of corrective role in, in terms right. of, you know, straightening out, you know, what, what is actually fact and what is false, which is obviously a huge, you know, important role that they're filling in doing that. I think, um, you know, uh, with that, it's, it's a tricky situation because, you know, I think just, just like with clickbait, it's something, you know, when, when we're now kind of getting a lot of our news from Twitter and I don't know if, if, or Twitter or other social media. And I don't know if you have any like specific figures as far as like, you probably know a lot more than me about how many people are getting their news that way versus actually, you know, going to say a site, you know, by itself, you know, like the Huffington post and getting their media, you know, directly from them yeah, uh, versus kind of just scrolling through their, their Twitter feed. Well, I think a lot of people when they're, 
looking for news on social media will just read the headline. And like, I think that that's just super problematic because you aren't getting the full context and nuance in which the headline has been written, you know? Absolutely. I mean, people are putting all this time into trying to report accurately and, and non-biased stories right. and, and you're not even giving them the chance to kind of portray, you know, uh, what they've learned. So, yeah, I think that, you know, that's, that's, it's an issue. Do you think that that is, it's getting worse or do you think it's just kind of been something that's been around for, for a while now that hasn't really been addressed? How do you mean by like a while? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that social media definitely, you know, ha has a big role, um, I would, I would assume in kind of, you know, changing a lot of people's news, ha uh, news consumption habits, you know, um, as, you know, people stop, say, like reading the newspaper every day and got more into reading the news online. And then I think it kind of became more into just reading, um, you know, little, uh, you know, Twitter, um, you know, tweets about news. Um, I think it's like we're getting hit by like so much information. Like, uh, I think the problem is people are kind of becoming like siloed into their own little bubbles, um, you know, of just like only following exclusively liberal or conservative accounts, like accounts on Twitter, which could be problematic, or like exclusively liberal or conservative accounts on Facebook and getting a very curated view of the world that's not reflective of reality. Right. Yeah, it's again the, the confirmation bias sort of stuff. Or where... Yeah, I mean, I know I'm kind of like beating a dead horse here. No, no. It's... I think that's like probably the biggest problem. Yeah, no, it's interesting, I guess, how that, that can sort of show up in a lot of different ways. I mean, because, you know, I, I think of like, I mean, I'm not even on Twitter right now, but I mean, back when I was, I felt like, you know, I kind of followed... Or, or, you know, say on Facebook, I feel like I, I, at least from my perspective that I follow kind of a, a diverse group of people that, you know, have opinions going all, all over the place and we'll see, you know, comments full of, you know, arguments about, you know, a certain opinion that's, that's put forth. But you bring up a good point that, you know, a lot of what we do see is based on the accounts we choose to follow. I mean, Right. No one, no one has the capacity to see, to read every news headline that gets posted on Twitter. It's, it's just impossible. I, mean, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, my, oh, go ahead. I mean, I, I just think from my perspective, a lot of the 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 problems with this has to do kind of with information overload nowadays, where people are are constantly being blasted with so much information um, from all these different angles. Uh, and it's it's all very kind of uh, shallow and oftentimes biased information, and um, you know, people I don't think uh, you know are really reading stories like people used to be. Um, yeah, I don't think so. You you think the same thing? Yeah, I mean, you find the same so thing? I think kind of in the last few years, it's been really really hard to keep up with everything that's been happening, and you know, a lot of journalists too that I've talked to are just like missing stuff. So, I mean, I couldn't imagine how difficult it would be for a member of the general public who's working in nine to five and supporting a family. It would be incredibly difficult for them to keep up on every little piece of the news that happened. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Do you, do you find any, you know, say, say we take that example of someone, you know, working nine to five, you know, they got a demanding job and kids at home and, and they do only have like a limited amount of time during the day to, you know, sort of accurately get their news. You know, do you have any um, resources or recommendations for, you know, how how someone could kind of get uh, as accurate and as non-biased of a of a view of what's going on in the world as they could? Yeah, um, I usually listen to the Daily, which is the New York Times podcast, which is pretty good. Um, they don't do all of the news stories, but they do like the one big story of the day, which is really cool. And uh, you can actually hear from the host and you can hear from the reporter um, who worked on the story, which is kind of a cool insight into like how the reporting process works, which I think is really valuable. That's um, really cool. Are you able yeah. to have like back and forth? Like, do they, is it a discourse between like the readers and the, the person who broke the story? So it's like a back and forth between the host of the show and then like the reporter. So like he's asking okay. them questions kind of like you're asking me right now and like 
the reporters responding to them. Um, and then also I listen to the, the journals podcast, which is just, uh, it's called the journal by the wall street journal. Um, it's about money, business and power. And they have like episodes about lots of different stuff. Like they've had an episode about, um, what it was like for Kalamazoo, Michigan to give like free college to everybody. And then they also had an episode about, um, the settlements for the companies that made like opioids and all right. that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I, I was just reading about that like last week. That seems like it's going to be a huge kind of ongoing story, right? Just kind of in the U S about the, it's the comp or it's, uh, is it the state government suing the, the manufacturers of like Oxycontin and the other opioids or? Yeah. So it's kind of complicated. Like there's been lots of like states, um, like state governments and um, attorneys generals, or yeah, I think it's attorney generals. That's right. Attorneys general is like the right word. Okay. For um, but essentially, lots of states government, state governments have been like suing these companies, and then like individuals as well have been suing them. So, mm. so it's been um, a company called Teva Pharmaceuticals, which is an Israeli company, Johnson and Johnson, and then Purdue Pharma, which is like the big one who have been producing OxyContin. And the lawsuit is basically, or the lawsuits, are they kind of alleging that these companies are, they were kind of misrepresenting what the drug was actually supposed to be used for? Um, that's a really good question. So there was a lawsuit that was settled um, recently in Oklahoma this week against Johnson & Johnson. And the, uh, the state had tested this legal theory about... Um, I believe this is correct. I have to go back and check, but Johnson and Johnson was essentially causing a public nuisance um, mm. through the distribution of the drug. But I'd have to go and double check that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly uh, a story, just the opioid epidemic where we've definitely been very publicly informed of that, you know, going on at least the past, you know, several years, it seems like now that it's been a pretty you know, significant kind of uh, well understood, well, I don't know about well understood, but well reported on health issue. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think like the problematic part of it is like, you don't want to essentially tell the story, like same story each time, you know, like you don't want to like always tell the story of like, oh, the high school football player who like tore his ACL and got addicted to Oxycontin and then died right. of an overdose, you know, kind of like breaking out of that mold of the story. So Right. Right. Do you, I mean, do you see that? Is that like just uh, sort of the re repetition that's a problem or is it kind of like just, do you think like using those kind of like personal anecdotes or like? No, I think the personal anecdotes are great. It's just more oh, okay. of like a frame. It's like kind of a framing problem, I think. Like you're going to hear the same story a million times over, but you just have to find a new different story, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody has kind of heard the story of like the star athlete that tore their ACL and then got addicted to Oxycontin. Right. So, I mean, it's kind of like more interesting to take a different look into like what the prescription rates are actually like or something like that. So Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of ways to attack that. And I think also just kind of more generally speaking, I think there's there's a lot of power in, uh, I mean, in, in one just knowing, you know, in, in reading up, you know, a story like that. But also, you know, I think it the opioid uh, thing in particular hits home with a lot of people you know, because there are, you know, a lot of people have, you know, personal anecdotes, you know, either for themselves oh, or their, their friends, right? you know, a lot of people know someone that's affected. And I think that can often like get people to, you know, pay attention to something that otherwise, if it's sort of, you know, sort of out of sight, out of mind, you know, mm -hmm. where they, they may hear that it's going on, but may not really like pay attention too much to it, like as an actual issue. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think yeah. you need to have like information and anecdotes that are relatable, but also at the same time, you run the risk of like telling the same story over and over again. Like, um, it's not exactly analogous, but kind of like interviewing people in a diner in Iowa, like you can only do that so many times, you know? Right. So, Probably yeah. a lot of uh, people at that diner in Iowa addicted to opioids, I'm guessing. No, I mean, I'm not saying that. Well, but I mean, yeah, I'm no, no. What I'm saying is like, yeah. You know, you run the risk of if you're going out to write a story about how people in Iowa are feeling before the caucuses, you can only interview so many people at a diner in Iowa. Or you can only like interview them so many times about how they feel about 
current politics. So All I right. think you just like run the risk of telling the same story over and over again, not breaking out into any new ground. So sure. Is that, I mean, that just brings to mind, like, do you feel like, uh, like, are there certain sites do you feel like that, that like break certain stories like that, like first, and then all, you know, a lot of the other sites, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of, you know, gravitate or, or, you know, are following what they're doing and then, you know, kind of tell the same story in a slightly different way. Is that, that's a good question. You know I mean, going on? there's, um, there's certain outlets that break like really unique stories that I find really valuable. Um, like Axios, like breaks all these really, really weird stories about the white house. Um, they recently broke the story about, um, Trump discussing in, I believe it was like a national security meeting about like nuking hurricanes. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think it was in a national security meeting, but they were like the first ones to break that um, story. And then like, yeah. the we're, we're going to be all good. We're going to be all good in here and Florida. Trump's going to take care of it. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that that's the case. So there's stories like that. And then um, there was a story that the journal broke about Trump wanting to buy Greenland. Um, and then they also broke the Trump Stormy Daniels story, which has been um, a huge story that people have been following. So I think that like, outlets will break large stories and then other people will kind of want to fill in the gaps if they can. So. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, kind of wanted to transition here. Um, so you, you recently wrote this, uh, story, you co-authored it. Is that right? The one on, on student debt or. Yeah, it was a triple buy one. Okay. Okay. So it was just something you were kind of, uh, kind of working on the, a lot of the summer doing the internship. Yeah, so they paired us with a mentor um, over the summer, which was really cool. It was a really great experience to work with somebody who is, um, you know, a more senior reporter and they kind of know their way around the organization. So I got paired with a, a mentor and she recruited me to kind of work on this story, which is really, really cool. Um, I met up with her in like the first or second week and I kind of like talked about, you know, what I was interested in and there was more of like an investigative angle to it. And she just kind of like recruited me to help uh, work on the story. So nice. And then I worked on it throughout the summer. Nice. And the, I mean, the story itself is, is awesome. Um, you know, really well, uh, good job on that. Um, I think it, it definitely brings up a lot of, you know, very important kind of societal issues, but specifically, you know, the story, um, and obviously you can go, um, a lot more in depth into this, but, um, from what I got out of the story, it was, you know, reporting on how a lot of there's a lot of these companies that have been kind of popping up that are sort of promising this solution to, mm -hmm. to student debt and uh, trying to, you know, frame it in a way, in a marketing way that is very inaccurate. Oftentimes, potentially, uh, I think you were saying in the story kind of, you know, just some some are just downright, you know, just scams, you know, right? Yeah. Um, and other ones are just still kind of not really, um, you know, reporting accurately because uh, I believe you said something that um, basically what these companies are offering is nothing that a student isn't already offered or, or isn't it's not already available, like through the through the government. Is that right? Um, essentially, it's kind of. Um, the best way to describe it is offering you a service that you can do yourself. Um, like one of these companies is helping you like fill out paperwork that you can do yourself, but they're just making it easier in a way. Um, I'm just pulling up the story right now to take a look at it. Yeah, so essentially it's just saying like, we'll help you do this paperwork that you could already do. So, mm -hmm. um, and they are taking advantage of students in some cases and sometimes from what former employees have told us and what other people have told us, like submitting fraudulent information. So, mm, Interesting. And how, what was kind of like the origin of that story? Were those people who had kind of fallen victim to the scams? Were they kind of contacting media outlets and being like, hey, like this is an issue going on? Or was there a different way it broke? Um, it was part of like a larger series that the journal was doing on um, just like debt in American life. And there was a story about kind of like other debt relief offers um, that are perhaps not the best offers that people should be taking up. And just like a larger story about kind of like debt relief in America. So, mm -hmm. and just kind of like the problems that Americans face with a large amount of debt. 
Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's something, uh, you know, I'd love to, you know, kind of talk more about that aspect because I mean, I think that's something, you know, that can have a lot of ramifications just for, for society. If, you know, if, I mean, as people are coming out of college with so much debt and then as was kind of reported in the story, you know, some people are kind of, you know, getting, you know, decades out of college and still haven't, you know, paid off their, their student debt. And it's, mm -hmm. I think going to start, I mean, if it already hasn't getting even more people to kind of start really questioning, you know, whether, uh, you know, whether something like college or say an advanced degree program, um, you know, is going to be worth it. And obviously, you know, you think about a lot of, you know, very well-respected professions, doctors and lawyers and, you know, uh, these professions that require advanced degree programs and often, you know, you know, asking people to take on hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, uh, of debt. I mean, is, is, do you think there's going to be some people who are going to be like, whoa, you know, maybe I don't want to go that route anymore? I mean, it's all about determining what works best for you. And it's like, if you really think you can see yourself like going to college and spending the money on a, a four year degree, and if you actually need it, I mean, these are the questions you should be asking yourself, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, I think. I think everyone like, I mean, no one is like envisioning that they're going to be like, that they're going to go to college and then like be stuck in debt until they're, you know, 30, 40 years old. Um, I think like it's uh, maybe people are overlooking like what, um, you know, what actually, you know, what's actually going to go into to repaying that debt or, or they just get out and like the, you know, the economy uh, or jobs that they're being offered with their current degree is just not getting them what they thought they could have gotten. But I mean, I, I think it's, I, I don't think people necessarily ever get into debt knowing that they're going to be getting into debt, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, um, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. I mean, a lot of times people are told that, you know, going to college is what you should be doing and you should be doing this, um, because this is the only way to succeed. And I, I don't think that's true. Um, I mean, there's vocational schools that provide people with great training for electricians and plumbers, and ultimately those jobs can also make a lot of money. So I think people really need to evaluate before they make the decision to go to a four-year uh, four school, do I really need to be doing this? And could I maybe do a few years at community college and then transfer? So, I mean, I think there's kind of a, some self-analysis that needs to be done before a lot of people make this decision. So Right. Yeah, and I don't know how, you know, how it was for you. I'm thinking back to kind of my, you know, experience getting into like, you know, an upperclassman in high school and kind of, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about college. I mean, it was never really thinking about college. The decision was not whether to go to college or not. It was which college am I going to go right. to? Right, exactly. And that's definitely kind of like a framing part of it, right? Like just kind of like how are you, how are people around you framing the discussion? Right. So, yeah. And it seems like most you know, kind of most adults, most uh, parents in this country, I mean, the ones who are, you know, financially well off enough, you know, to sort of help their kids, or, or at least it's plausible for their kids to, you know, go to college, I think, you know, for, for the majority, they're, they're strongly encouraging yeah, definitely. Kids, to, to, kids to go, yeah. even though it may not actually always end up being the best option, you know, financially, um, definitely. or in another way. I guess it's kind of like evaluating all of your options and not ruling anything out and figure out what's best for you and don't let other people kind of direct you to making a decision that may not be right for you at the time. So. Right. Absolutely. And I think speaking of kind of options, you know, the, the new wave of kind of online education, what, what are your thoughts about that as far as, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, colleges now very, um, you know, well-esteemed, uh, well-respected colleges. I think Stanford, uh, Harvard, I believe, have, you know, online education programs set up. Um, and some of them, I believe, are, are, you know, for the general public where you can take, um, like, I think I was doing like a, like a Harvard kind of neuroscience intro, mm -hmm. which is sort of online for free. And it was, it's like, man, if, if you can learn that information, if this information is out there and has kind of this open access, it, you know, sort of raises the question even more, like, 
is college, you know, is the, the high uh, tuition costs and, and all the other um, fees and, and whatnot that come with a college education, is that something, you know, I guess probably varies, you know, person to person. But do you, what do you think about that nowadays? Do you think there's good options for, for someone, you know, wanting to, you know, pursue like an online degree program or? I mean, I haven't, think about I haven't that? seen, um, I haven't seen all of the options that are available, but it's pretty great that you know, these schools are offering um, courses online. I think it's really cool. Um, that's obviously a very broad and generic statement, but I think the more information that's online is the better. And just allowing people to kind of get that information before they make the decision to um, either go or commute to school is really valuable. And especially for people who want to pick up some extra knowledge on the side too. I mean, Absolutely. you're already graduated from college, right? But you yeah. could go on to a like Khan Academy or something and learn more about organic chemistry in your free time if you really wanted to. So I think that's Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, that's a great point. That I mean, actually, right now I'm I'm lucky enough that I was able to fit this into my work schedule since I'm off mornings. I'm uh, currently auditing a graduate neuroscience class, like an intro neuroscience class at FAU, the the nearby uh, college, mm -hmm. and it's super awesome that I'm able to do that. But it's like if it wasn't, you know, plausible that I was able to fit that into my schedule, um, which I barely was able to do so. I mean, it's awesome that, you know, there is that sort of online option, you know, for kind of doing it sort of at your own pace um, when you get a chance and not necessarily having to show up at lectures, you know, at certain times of the day, you mm -hmm. know, certain days of the week. I think that really revolutionizes things for, for people who, you know, like you're saying, you know, kind of want to continue with their education, um, but maybe they have full-time jobs or, you know, some other kind of commitment, you know, they're mm -hmm. a single parent or, you know, something like that. Yeah, I definitely agree. And education is ultimately, I think, the most valuable thing and something that you can't underinvest in. So. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think like, I think online education, you know, it, it definitely, I mean, you can have some great instructors. I mean, I've learned, you know, a ton about mm -hmm. neuroscience, you know, or, or biology or, you know, stuff like that, just on Khan Academy, you know, completely for free. Uh, but I think, you know, what, what may end up coming as far as, you know, what, what may be missing with online education that I think is very valuable with, you know, a standard kind of academic track going through university is, is the social aspect of college. Definitely. And I think, I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but I feel like, you know, a lot of the tools that I, I learned in college were not necessarily those that I gained in a classroom in, yeah. in a lecture hall. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, I guess for some people, having the online education is probably more valuable than having the social aspect of it. I mean, there's a lot of people that I've seen in my classes who... Um, they're definitely older, like in their mid fifties who are coming back to school and, you know, maybe doing a class online, maybe the right decision for them. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you're, you're right as far as, as keeping your options open. And, um, I think it's great that we're getting more and more options of, of, you know, uh, more and more easily accessible, uh, solid education. Cause I think, you know, you know, say, you know, before Google, you know, if I wanted to know something, obviously, may, might have to go to, you know, could even be like a university library if it was something like specific, yeah. you know, related to like neuroscience. I wanted mm -hmm. to know what glial cells do in the brain or whatever. You know, I'd have to like, you know, do a uh, bunch of research and do a bunch of research. Yep. Yeah, actually get off my ass and, and do that <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of just being able to do it with a few clicks of the button. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly something that I'm I'm very curious as far as how that is going to continue playing out, and you know, it I I sort of almost I was just making this connection that it, it sort of seems sort of like the like with football, you know, with how we're sort of realizing how damaging you know concussions are to the brain, mm -hmm. and how you know I feel like we're starting to see uh, you know some athletes. Uh, you know, actually be like, you know, I'm not, you know, playing football. Um, but obviously the NFL is still, you know, a huge thing and right. college football, you know, the stadiums are often even bigger and generate tons of revenue for the university. So as far as, 
you know, how far out we are from like sort of that actually influencing people to not play football and then sort of relating that back to how far out are we from like online education actually like, you know, changing the game for some, you know, co you know, some high school kid like we, you know, like both of us were, you know, a few years ago who, who were just kind of like, you know, we're, we're going into college, like this is what everyone does. But, mm -hmm. you know, at some point, I think there is going to be, you know, people that instead choose to kind of go the online route. Yeah, I think that more people are, I'm not quite sure the connection you're trying to make between like football and college, but like, I definitely get it. Like, I think that like, people are becoming more aware of kind of like the impacts and consequences of football for sure. Um, right. And hopefully, I guess, if I'm understanding the point you're trying to make correctly, um, hopefully people will understand the impacts and um, the benefits of online education too. So, right. Yeah. That didn't, it, was that what you I, were going I may have not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I may have not fully fleshed that. I was basically trying to say like, you know, the, the, it's sort of like, the beginning of a change where I feel like, like in football, oh, it's okay. sort of, we've gotten the public awareness of like the damage, you know, uh, how, how damaging concussions are. And just like, you know, we sort of now have the public awareness of like, damn college really is super expensive. Oh, like okay. both of them are kind of like, you know, significant societal problems. I feel like at the, you know, at the moment and okay. they both sort of have remedies, but, it would, you know, it's going to require like a very significant change, you know, uh, as far as to actually like get to that point where either people aren't, you know, playing football or, you know, aren't going mm -hmm. to, you know, a standard four year in person university. Yeah, if that makes sense. No, that that makes a lot more sense now. Okay, okay. yeah, I may not have done a great job explaining that first. Um, but I guess, you know, this is kind of a, a million dollar question, but I mean, say, you know, in, in your case, do you feel like, uh, you know, I, and then again, you're, you're not completely out of college yet. Yeah. Um, but do you feel like you're going to graduate this coming year with the, not with, with, um, kind of knowing that it either was or was not worth it for you? Do you have a, a clear sense of that? Yeah. Um, I certainly think it was worth it. Um, I feel like I was able to learn a lot about a lot of different things and I was really um, grateful for the opportunity to do a double major because kind of having the, um, the political science major of understanding how and why people think about politics and the evolution of um, democracy and democratic thought was really valuable. And um, the opportunities that I've been presented at the UO um, to work on group projects that have turned into published stories have been really, really valuable. and. I don't think I, if I didn't have those opportunities, I definitely would not be um, being able to kind of do the things that I've wanted to do and have, I don't think I would have been able to do what I've wanted to do and do all that stuff if I didn't go to college, so. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I was going to bring it back <laughs> to like, you know, with the, with the Wall Street Journal, it seems like, like you were saying, like that was something you, you originally got kind of through uh, through the Eugene Weekly, right? Um, yeah, that, that uh, it was sort of. I'm guessing you kind of did. Did I, I, what I'm sort of trying to get at is, did you feel like kind of you writing for the Emerald was sort of like the the beginning, like sort of kind of catapulted you to the each level? I mean, yeah, it all like builds on getting. each other, right? Yeah. Um, so I mean, like, if I didn't write for the Emerald, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work on a group project for a class that got published in Eugene Weekly, and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to intern at Eugene Weekly and get the clips that I needed to get to ultimately do an internship at the Wall Street Journal. So it all builds on each other, definitely. Right, right. No, I mean, and that's awesome. I don't know if I've explained this like super well, and I've tripped over my words a few times, but that's kind of what I'm trying to get at, is it all builds on each other. So Yeah, no, no, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I feel like it's it's nice, you know, having that, you know, sort of firm knowledge that, you know, uh, you know, this investment, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, you or your parents or, or grandparents, whoever it is kind of paying for your education. Um, we obviously all want it to, to pay off and be able to eventually kind of, you know, support ourselves and, and get into good, good paying jobs. And, um, 
I think it's awesome that that you've had that experience, even though like I feel like a lot of a lot of people are now that's kind of why I, I sort of was prompted to ask that question about like, do you think college is worth it? Because I feel like a lot of people maybe, you know, sort of similar to those people that you, you know, sort of uh, included in that Wall Street Journal article about, you know, they're getting out of college and aren't finding the jobs that they wanted to get or or at least the salary, you know, making the salaries that they had wanted to make. Um, and then they're kind of questioning, you know, was college worth it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't interview the the people who we quoted in the article that was um, the other people who were on the byline. But, um, you know, the real problem is having these uh, companies that are taking advantage of people who are in a desperate situation. So, right. And yeah. um, definitely, you know, having that much debt is also a very large problem um, and kind of feeling the need to go to college when maybe you shouldn't or you don't have to. So mm -hmm. it all kind of yeah. ties into each other. It does. Yeah. It's, it's something that, I mean, especially kind of, uh, I guess maybe coming from kind of a, you know, if, if we take an example of someone coming from like more of a kind of working class, you know, blue collar sort of, sort of family where, you know, they could potentially make, you know, um, a certain amount of money that, that, you know, is going to pay the bills, um, you know, without going to college. But then I feel like in some ways there, there's sort of, sort of the idea that, that it sort of gets capped where like you're, you're the amount you could make. And I don't know if this is a, I don't actually believe it myself that it's true, but I think like, you know, people tend to think that, oh, if I go to college now I can make this much more money. And mm -hmm. then if I get my master's degree and I can make this much money and then PH, you know, you like at least in my field, you know, with neuroscience, like you can keep stacking them up higher and higher. And that may be true for certain disciplines, like say in the world of academia. Um, but if you're, you're an entrepreneur or, you know, doing something else, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Yeah, probably not. I mean, like yeah. it's all very subjective to the, the situation you're in and what your life is like. So Right. Um, I mean, that's why probably I'm not going to go to school and get like a master's degree in journalism or something. It's like I just don't really see like the added value that it would come with. So interesting. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. I haven't you know thought of, obviously, since I'm not a, a journalism major. But is that so is that what what do people hope do you think that they're going to get out of like, is the idea more so to develop their journalistic skills or is that more so like getting the internships and things that may land hmm. you a well uh, you know a good paying job i don't know um i would have to ask um people who have done that but um i can give you my answer if that's helpful i just don't necessarily believe that it's um the best course for myself because i kind of wanted to start working and i think that in the industry that i'm in kind of like producing clips and content and really, really digging down on something is more valuable than maybe going to school for another year or another two years. So Absolutely. I just don't think it's the right decision for me. Maybe if I wanted to like teach or something in the future, it'd be helpful to kind of go back to school for that kind of thing. But right now I just don't see it as being the right choice. So, right. Now I think you're, you're, you know, you're doing it the right way. I mean, you're, you're, you're smart in the sense that you have an idea of what, you know, what you want to be doing. Whereas, so, you know, I think oftentimes, um, I mean, and I was this way, you know, for a lot of college where I, I was just going through, you know, kind of pursuing classes that I was passionate about, but not necessarily being like, oh yeah, I'm going to get my bachelor's of science mm -hmm. in psychology so I can go work in this neuroscience lab in Florida. Like, it, you know, it was not at all a linear path. Like it was just kind of like, see what happens and no i mean it doesn't have to be linear either yeah i mean and like not to say that your path was but... no it wasn't it wasn't linear at all yeah. like i didn't expect um i didn't expect to end up at the wall street journal at the end of my junior year in college at all like that's completely if you would have told me that in my freshman year of college i would have laughed so i mean it's not linear but just kind of figuring out what works the best for you is the most important thing sweet yeah totally agree Cool, man. Well, uh, I really enjoyed talking with you. 
are, is there anything else you feel like that, I mean, I feel like we, we, I think we did a good job of kind of flushing out, um, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of, and raising kind of a lot of uh, good points just in the whole world of, of journalism and um, kind of society right now. Anything else you wanted to touch on? Um, I would just say to, not sure how many people are going to watch this, and I hope it's a lot. Um, <laughs> so if you guys are watching this, please uh, read as many news sources as you can and really, really try and read different things because it's important to seek out different news outlets and see what they're bringing to you um, instead of just reading what's directly on your Twitter timeline because that's how you kind of get trapped in these dogmatic narratives of the media is covering only X and they're not covering Y, which is not true. Um, The media is a very broad term and the media is often used to refer to a single entity when in fact it's really multiple entities who are covering different things. So please read as much information as you can. Um, Support student journalism and subscribe and pay for your news because it pays people salaries and they also need it. So awesome. And also it helps to bring the really, really important content that we need to um, have a healthy discourse and functioning democracy. So it's important. Right. And tell people, tell people where they can go, you know, if they're interested in, you know, say reading, reading that story, uh, can they just find it by like Googling your name with the Wall Street Journal or is there anywhere that you would direct them? Oh, are you talking about the student loan story? Well, either that or just in general, just, um, you know, how they, how, you know, if you want to share any kind of social media handles or, uh, oh, yeah. you know, uh, any way people can get in touch with you. If yeah, my, my Twitter handle is uh, at Tobin. T O B I N underscore tweets, T W E E T S. So I generally share like all of my content that I write on my social media. So awesome. So yep. if you want to keep up with Michael, go follow him there. Yep. Sweet, man. Cool. Well, I really enjoyed talking with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right.